Hey, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Chris. Uh, I work here at Faith Family Church. Um, I'm on staff. I'm our Connect Team Director. So uh, we have a lot of teams that volunteer all around um, all the time, doing all kinds of different things. And I just get the opportunity to work with a ton of amazing volunteers who volunteer their time to make what we do happen here. So it's awesome. But um, uh, if you're brand new to the U, um, I'm not Josh Pancher. And Josh is the pastor back here. He's usually the guy who gets up and gets to talk to you guys. So please do not judge the U by my performance tonight. Come back next week and see Josh because he's the man, the myth, the legend, the guy who makes it all happen, so make sure you come back, but um, tonight he asked me to share with you guys for week two of the series Occupy All Streets, and I'm pumped to get to talk to you guys about it, so we've just been talking about Occupy All Streets, what's that mean? It just means, uh, come on, we all, we're, we're all in different places in life, we all have our own street, so how do we occupy that street? How do we, how do, we do um, what God wants us to do, or how do we uh, uh, really just, come on, show people the love of God and the love of Jesus wherever we find ourselves in life, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I'm excited because, uh, man, I don't get to do this very often. Um, they don't always trust me to have a microphone in my hand. So when they do, God, you just never know what's going to happen. So I'm just ready to have some fun tonight. But is that okay? Can we have fun tonight? Yeah. I'm like a... There's this, um, there's this thing where I come from, which I come from Canton, Ohio, so it's, it's also a thing where most of you come from, where when somebody asks a question, you just answer, you know? So I'm going to say things like, does that make sense? And then you guys got to say things like, yeah, or you could say no, but just pretend like it does make sense all the time. And, um, and that's just going to help things go a lot smoother, because if I feel like you don't understand, then I'm going to keep repeating myself, and it's going to get repetitive and boring, and we just, none of us wants that. We all want to go study for finals and stuff, right? That's what we want to do, so... Yeah, just kidding. So, um, hey, I'm going to uh, kind of get things rolling here. Um, but, hey, can we just, can we just talk about um, uh, things that get awkward as you get older or things that, like, change in life as you get older, right? There are things, <laughs> somebody said preach. I like this. This is good. This is good talk back. There's, just thing, there's things that you expect to get different as you get older, right? Like, you expect that, like, I'm probably, as I get older, I'm going to have, like, a little bit less free time because I'm going to have to like work a little bit more than I had to when I was younger, right? There's things like I'm going to have um, a little bit less freedom to just do whatever I want, and I'm going to have to do, uh, have a little bit more like responsibility. It's not fun, but it's like why they have a hashtag adulting, right? It's just something that happens as you get older. Um, there's some things that change as you get older that um, uh, you don't quite think about, because like why would that be a thing that's going to change? And, and I'm just going to tell you a short story about one of those things that's just going to set us up for tonight. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot to do, but I'm going to do like a nice little like voodoo, or voodoo, that's the wrong word. <laughs> I'm going to do some voodoo in church tonight. You guys ready? I'm going to do a little Houdini act here is what I was trying to say, and I'm going to make it all fit together, okay? So just, just be watching. Dear God, help me, voodoo. Um, so one of these things that has changed for me as I've gotten older that I never expected to change is my Netflix experience. You're like, Netflix experience? What does this mean? I'm not talking about Netflix and chill. I am married, so I can do that, but... Um, I'm talking about, everyone's like, oh, <laughs> that was awful. Don't say that. Um, no, so, so you guys know how you get those notifications when a new season comes out on Netflix, and it's like, hey, we just thought you would like to know this show that you watch, a new season is out, and you're like, oh, well, praise the Lord, you know? New season of The Walking Dead. That's awesome. God put that there just for me, you know? And so there's like things like that. You look forward to those notifications, right? Um, like, hey, we just thought you would like to know, based on the things that you've watched, here's a show that you might like that is on Netflix. And you're like, oh, well, that's awesome. I'm gonna, now I have something new to binge watch because I've watched The Office 15 times already. And so I, I need something new in my life, you know? So it's good. Well, um, so I have a, a five-year-old son and a seven-year-old daughter, okay? And so what has happened, um, this, this started a few years back and it's just slowly like snowballed, is that they have hijacked my Netflix account, right? And so I thought I was doing the right thing by by putting different logins on there. So, you know, when you log in, it's got the different smiley faces that are different colors, and you can put a name underneath it. So, you know, so like, there's one that says Chris, and there's one that my wife says Megan. She has her own because I don't care about, like, HGTV and, like, that kind of stuff, and she does. So I'm like, you watch your weird chick flick stuff. I'll watch my stuff over here. And then we have one that's uh, the kids, you know, and that's the one that they watch. Well, so it turns out that the kids just don't care about the natural order of things. Dad, you know, mom, just kidding, dad and mom. And then kids down here. And so they just do whatever they want. So they log in on dad's Netflix all the time. And the reason I know this is because I started getting these email notifications that were like, hey, we just thought you would like to know that there's a new Barbie movie on Netflix. And I'm like, what? You know, like uh, the first time this happened, I think it was like, uh, what's that, like My Little Pony or whatever. And I'm like, 
I'm not a brony. Like, this isn't something that I do. I don't watch this show, you know? And, uh, and so, like, the last one that I got um, was, uh, it said, uh, there's a new uh, movie, you, uh, Captain Underpants, that you would like to watch. And so, um, I'm just going to be honest, I actually watched that one <laughs> with my son. I was like, come on, buddy, hey, let's watch this. And I laughed far more than I probably should have being an adult. But, um, but it's just one of those things that, that changes as you get older. But one cool thing about this, when you get older, is that you get to introduce your kids to all the stuff that you loved when you were their age. So does anybody here like love Disney movies? Yeah? Yeah? All right, now hold on, though, because when I'm talking about Disney movies, I'm not talking about like Moana and like Fro- Frozen. <laughs> Ah, you just got offended. Hey, he's leaving. <laughs> he's just... <laughs> oh, my bad, bro. <laughs> That is awesome. Um, uh, Frozen. I've watched Frozen like 37 times because my daughter watched it uh, like once a week for a year. That's actually 52 times, so my math's off, but it's all right. Um, but no, they watch those movies like, so I've seen all the new ones, but I'm talking about like Aladdin and like Lion King. All right. All right. <laughs> So this is good. I was wondering, like, I'm like, I, you know, I don't feel like I'm too old, but you kind of just wonder, like, do people, like, still watch the old Disney movies? I don't know. So I'm glad that you guys are all with me here. But who, like, who, um, Cinderella is, like, your favorite Disney movie? <laughs> you almost did it. He was like, no, not Cinderella. I thought you were going to say Aladdin, you know? Um, who, uh, like, The Little Mermaid? All right. All right. A couple. All right. Two hands. Two hands down front. All right. What about, what about Aladdin? Aladdin? All right. Aladdin was always my favorite growing up. You know, there's this one time, this has nothing to do with anything, but like I said, I got the mic, hey. Um, There's this time when I was in school, I was in like fourth grade or something. And uh, me and this girl, um, we were we were friends, in, uh, and we decided that we were gonna put on like an Aladdin show for our for our class. And so the teacher was like, "Okay, that's fine. You know, it's probably weird a little bit, but it's fine. So you guys can get up and sing a song or whatever at the end." And so then it came to the part where I was supposed to get up, but I completely got stage fright, and so I just like stayed sitting down. So I just left my friend like out to dry in front of our whole class. So side note, it really happened. I used to have really bad stage fright, so clearly I still do. Um, but what about Lion King? Who, like, loves the Lion King? Awesome, awesome. As I've gotten older, I've, like, really grown to appreciate the Lion King more when I was younger. I don't know if it's just because I, like, didn't get it as much or, like, the themes were, like, too, too like, over my head or what. Um, but that's, like, something I've, I've grown to, to love, you know? Um, there was one particular part in the Lion King that actually really confused me when I was a little kid. When I say little kid, I'm talking, like, little kid, so don't judge me for this. All right, I'm going to bare my soul to you guys right now. But, you know, like, when Simba... Meets up with Timon and Pumbaa for the first time, right? And they teach him Hakuna Matata, right? And, he, and they're like, he's like, what, Hakuna Matata, what's that? And they're like, it's our motto. And he's like, well, what's a motto? Nothing, what's a motto with you? <laughs> dad jokes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that, um, <laughs> you guys are awesome. Easy crowd tonight, hey. <laughs> um, but no, so you know how after that, then they start singing the song, and then it comes to that thing, and they're on that, there's that log bridge, and they're like, Hakuna Matata, Hakuna Matata. You know, and like uh, Simba is slowly getting older as it happens. It's like this time lapse where he's like, oh, first he's like Cub Simba. And then like three steps later, he's like weird, awkward teenage face Simba with like the weird patch of hair and like not quite a full mane, you know? And then like a couple of steps further, then he's like full grown Simba and he's got some swag and he somehow gets a real soulful voice, you know what I mean? It means no worries for the rest of your days. It's all problem free. Yeah, Hakuna Matata. Yeah, there we go. So, so, so that whole part, though, I'd get really confused. Like, Mom, did, how did he get so old so fast? She's like, honey, that's a time lapse. And I'm like, Mom, you can't just make words up. It's not a thing. You know? But, um, but, so this is my segue, all right? So this Hakuna Matata thing, though, right, means no worries. That's something that, like, as a kid, that's like, you want that. You're like, yeah, it means no worries. You know, eat the grubs, slimy, it's satisfying. You know, it's, it's awesome. You just do what you want, and everything is great. But then you kind of, like, realize as you get older, like, wait, hold on a second. Hakuna Matata... That just means you're ignoring everything bad that's going on around you. You are an irresponsible person. You should not do that, you know? Like, like what happens is, is Nala comes, right? And she ruins everything, and they sing, Can you feel the love tonight? And that whole song. And, and Nala comes, and she tells him, like, like, bro, everything is terrible back home at Pride Rock, right? She's like, Scarlet, the hyenas loose. And he's like, hyenas? In the Pride Lands? 
No, no, no. They just go in the elephant graveyard. They don't go in the pride lands. Something's wrong, you know? And so what happens though, right, is Simba figures out, okay, he has this like, you know, he goes and Rafiki beats him on the head and sees his dad in the water and, you know, it's, it's great. It's touching. You're like, oh, your dad is, he's there, but he's inside of you. It's amazing, you know? And so, but he realizes, like, there's all this stuff going on back at Pride Rock, back home. And, and I'm like, I'm the son of the king who died. And so I actually have the authority to go do something about it. I have the responsibility to go do something about it. So crap, I got, I got to go do something about it. Like, I can't just, like, sit here and eat grubby worms. I got to go. I got I to gotta go. And then he, phew, and he takes off. And then that's where that, you know, well, maybe you guys don't know about the dust in the air and it spells a bad word. And, you know, we'll, we'll just skip that. It's one of those Disney, like, trivia things. Oh, I don't, we're, all, we're all adults here. Never mind. Um, so, but, this is getting awkward. Um, but that's going to, that's, that's kind of like, it made me think about, um, isn't that like a good analogy, though, for us sometimes, Right? Um, I'm changing gears real fast here. It's been really funny, and now it's going to get like, oh, he punched me in the stomach, right? Isn't this where we find ourselves sometimes, like, like sometimes it feels really good to just kind of be in my place and have fun and do what I want to do and pursue the things that I think are going to be good for my life, hakuna matata, no worries, doesn't matter, but really what we're doing is we're leaving all the people around us to live in hell, Right? Like, there is pain, and there's brokenness in our families and the places that we come from. We have friends who are in terrible relationships, who are dealing with substance abuse, who are doing all kinds of crazy things, and we're like, but hold on, I'm like slimy, yeah, satisfying over here. You do you, I'm going to do me, I'm just going to, right? But like, what if I told you that, like, you have your own pride rock, the same way that Simba had to go back... You like how I'm preaching from Lion King right now? I'm just saying it's an awesome thing. Simba had to go back to his pride rock and make some things change and do some things to, to get, help people get out of the brokenness that they were living in and the drought that they were living in and the deadness and the death that they were living in. Deadness isn't a word, but I used it. The, the, the same way that that happened, God has you to go back to the dead places in your life and bring life and bring hope and bring restoration, right? So tonight we're going to talk from... Tonight we're going to talk from the title, Answering the Call. Answering the Call, subtitle, if you want to, is Saving Pride Rock, because you don't use a Lion King reference without using a Lion King title, okay? Let's go ahead and pray and get into this tonight. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you that your word is good to teach us. It's good to challenge us. It's good to show us where we're wrong and to show us what we can do to get right. And God, we just thank you that you have a call that you've put on our life to uh, affect and impact the people around us. And God, we pray that tonight, as we hear from your word, we would be um, inspired and challenged to do just that, to go into our spheres of influence, to go into um, whatever place that we uh, have contact with in our day-to-day lives, and we can go in those places and make an impact for you and see people walk from death to life. So God, show us how, uh, reveal it to us, and we just thank you that through the process you are with us, guiding us, teaching us, and you're not leaving us to do it on our own. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So, so, we ready? We're going to dive into this thing. So, the crazy statistic, um, I, I was looking at this, or I guess I was just thinking about this idea of brokenness, this idea of like, okay, so we have our own pride rock, you know, we have our own places that we step foot in or the places that we came from, that there is brokenness that exists, you know. We all know that brokenness exists in the world, right? That's like why you have to eat all your oatmeal when you're a kid because there are starving kids in China, you know. Like, we know that there's brokenness in the world, but like, there's brokenness in your world, there's brokenness in my world. It's, it's right here. And so I was looking up some, some stuff just because I wanted to put, uh, I guess, some, uh, just some reality to this. And so statistically, United States, statistically, uh, in this room, this is statistically, so, you know, it could be uh, less, it could be more, but statistically, in this room, 20% of the people in this room have been sexually abused at some point in their life. That's crazy. That's, that's pain and brokenness in our world, right here. Statistically, every person in this room knows somebody, whether you know it or not, you know somebody who's been sexually abused. That's crazy, right? 
I'm sure like it wouldn't take you long to think of somebody in your life that you know who deals with depression, who deals with anxiety, who just lives in just chronic bad de decisions for their life, just bad decision after bad decision, who is uh, somebody who just goes from bad relationship to bad relationship to bad relationship, right? Um, somebody who deals with substance abuse, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's whatever. We all know people like that in our life. We don't have to look far away to see brokenness in our life. But what if, what if the reason that we are where we are is because God sent us there to be the person to help heal that brokenness? Like, we know that we don't heal it ourselves. Like, God is the healer. But what if, what if we are in the place that we are we have the sphere of influence that we have. We have the friends that we have. We have the crazy jacked up family that we have. Because God actually wants us to impact them for him. God wants us to impact brokenness in the world and actually see it healed and see life come out of it. I'm going to share with you guys real quick. So you're like, okay, well, how do we know, right? Um, how do we know that God wants to do that? So I'm going to share with you real quick three indicators that God wants to change the world, really that God wants to use you to change the world. The first one is this, that he modeled it through Jesus. So John 14, 9 says this. Is, this is just part of the verse, um, but it says, the one who has seen me, this is Jesus talking, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. So he's telling us, by looking at Jesus... We can see God. By looking at what Jesus did, we can see the heart of the Father. By looking at Jesus' interactions, the way that he impacted the world, we can see the way that God wants to impact the world. Well, what did we see Jesus do in the world? We saw Jesus heal people in the world. We saw Jesus come in contact with sickness and heal it. We saw Jesus come in contact with oppression and heal it. We saw people come in contact with people who were cast out by society, who society said, no, you don't touch them. No, you don't talk to them. No, you don't need to be around them. Those are bad people. We don't want anything to do with them. And he broke all those social norms uh, to the point where they thought he was, right, like a prince of the devil himself. Uh, They're like, why does he hang out with such scum? Is that's what they said about Jesus, right? He broke those norms. Why? To bring healing and to bring hope and to bring life into them, right? We see Jesus heal people from, from being possessed by demons, and we see him heal the blind, and we see him heal the sick, and, and we see him take, you know, the woman in adultery who was getting ready to get stoned to death because this is, this is a morally bankrupt act that she's just committed, and what's he do? She was wrong. She was wrong, right? Like there's no, somebody commits adultery today, we're not like, oh yeah, good job. You know, no, it's still something that we say like, oh, you slept with his wife? Uh, you slept with, with her husband? Ah, uh, that's not a good thing, you know? Like this is what happened, right? It's desperate housewives, right? Like this is, is no good thing, right? But what did Jesus do? He saved her from death, literally from death, and he told her like, yeah, you need to change your life, like go and do this no more, but look, there's nobody here to condemn you. He changed the death and the brokenness in these people's lives to hope and new life, right? So that's the first thing. He modeled it through Jesus. How do we know he wants to change the world? Because he modeled it. Second thing, he did it for you. Most of us probably in this place are here because God did something in our lives. If you're not here for that reason, you're probably here because you're hoping that God does something for your life. Good news, he did. He died on the cross for you so that you could have right standing with God and so that you could walk from death to life and experience the fullness that he has for your life, okay? But for those of us who've already accepted Jesus and we know that, we're, we're here for that reason. We know that God did something in our life. He took something that was broken, that was lost. He, he took something and he, and he exchanged it for, this, for life and hope and for, for, for living in the fullness that he has for us. He actually did, he did it in me, he did it in you. He wants to do it in the world around you. And the third thing is he told you that you would do it. John 14, 12 through 14, it says this, this is Jesus talking, he says, I assure you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he'll do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father might be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. <clears throat> Jesus is literally telling us that we, if we believe in him, are able to impact our world the same way that he impacted his world. 
That's crazy. It's crazy. If we believe in Jesus, like the moment that we believe, God makes us a new creature, he makes us a new creation, and he births in us this ability to bring life into a broken world. What does that mean? That means, that means our friends that live in depression, they don't have to live in depression anymore because we're their friends and we have Jesus. That means our friends that live in addiction, they don't have to live in addiction anymore because we're their friends and we have Jesus, right? That means those friends who live under the shame of sexual abuse don't have to live in that shame anymore because they have a God who loves them, who cares passionately about them, who thinks they're beautiful, and he sent you into their life to tell them that, right? Our friends who deal with, with, uh, with uh, I think I already said addiction, didn't I? Um, I had a whole list of things here, and it was going to be really impactful, but, but the truth is that that we deal with, with these things in our lives that um, uh, before we, we know Jesus or, or we have friends who deal with these things in our lives that, that, that if they don't know Jesus, they think this is just part of who I am. I, I have to live with this shame in my past because these are the things that I did in my past. I have to live with this shame because this is the thing that happened to me in my past. I have to live with this addiction because I made bad choices and, and here I am and well, I guess this is just the rest of my life and this is where I've gotta be. We have friends who they're stuck in this rut, in this self-destructive cycle because they think this is all there is for me. I made my bed, now I've got to lay in it. This is it for me. Or I was born into this. The, the path was laid out ahead of me and this is where it is for me. This is where I am. But God's saying, no, it's not. I sent Jesus for you so that you could have a new life because I never intended for this brokenness to exist in the world anyways. So I sent my, my son to take it all on himself so that this could just be done away with, so that we could have the relationship that I designed the world to exist around, so that you could have life, so that you could have hope, so that you could have a good future. But what happens is that these people, they need somebody to tell them about it. And that's where you come in. Because he says, if you believe in me, you'll do the works that I do, even greater works. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. All we gotta do is ask, man. God, would you move in the lives of my sister and my brother who are living this way? If, if you guys have heard, ever heard me talk before, you've probably heard me talk about my family. I have like a really crazy family. Uh, really long story short, I'm the youngest of 10. I have two sisters. Um, I'm one and then seven brothers. Um, of my seven brothers um, and myself, there's only three of us who aren't convicted felons, okay? Uh, one of them is because he died at 17. He committed suicide. Uh, one of them is because he went into the army, and then I'm the other one, and all the rest multi-convicted felons, right? So I live in this crazy. I live in a crazy family, and my one older sister too. She she used to be um, like I, I remember like her being in a, 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 like withdrawal from when she was like coming off of cocaine. You know what I mean? Like on our couch, just like laid out and like cold sweats and just shaking. And I was like, I come from a crazy family. But why am I in that family to show them that come on, you can break the freaking cycle. You don't have to live this way. God wants more for your life. But there's this period of time when, when I hated my family. Like, I did not want to be around my family. I was tired of every family function. There's fighting. I was tired of, like, the fear that so-and-so brother is going to show up and it's just going to be drama and there's going to be fighting. Like, I've watched my brothers put each other through just coffee tables and, and I've seen my brothers and my dad fist fighting and just, you know, my, like, come on, like, who, who just punches their dad in the face? You know what I mean? Like, it just, that's just a, it, there's something that just doesn't sit right with you when you see that. And so there's a time when I'm just like, I don't want anything to do with my family. But then God started to kind of deal with me and he's like, do you want your family to experience the life that you experience? Like, growing up, I had teachers tell me, like, you're going to live under a bridge when you get older. Like, you're, you, you don't have anything going for you. You know, like, you're, you're, you're a lost cause. You know what I mean? Uh, growing up, I had it laid out for me. Like, my path was prison, right? Like, that's all my brothers went. That was, like, the path that I had for me. I, did. I was terrible in school, all that kind of stuff. My path was, like, selling drugs, being a thief, going to prison, uh, being terrible with women. But something happened when I encountered God, and he changed all that in me. 
And, and so, so now, like, me and my wife are getting ready to, uh, to celebrate nine years of marriage this year, right? And so, yeah, it's awesome. So um, out of my 10 siblings, I'm, I'm the first one who didn't have kids out of wedlock, right? So I waited till I was married to have kids. And, and this isn't to, like, bash my family. Like, I love my family, right? Like, um, but the, the whole thing is that I have experienced a different life than my family has experienced. But the thing is, like... My family, if given the choice, they would choose a different life than what they live. Like, my siblings, they they don't, it's not like they enjoy going to jail. It's not like they enjoy fighting for everything. It's not like they enjoy drama and broken relationships and and, and having to be, you know, scared of the cops coming and raining. That's not a fun existence. That's not a fun life. But who has told them that there's a different life? Who has told them that there is a God who loves them, who can make a way out of that life? And that even though their past might look a certain way, their future doesn't have to look the same as their past. Who is there to tell them that if not me? Right? I remember when my brother was in jail the one time and I was writing back and forth to him and he was just saying like, bro, I'm too far gone. Like, I'm, I'm too far gone. There's nothing I can do now. And I just remember telling, like, writing in this letter. Um, like, I read the letter he sent me. I write back. I'm like, no, man. Like, God has a better plan for you than that. Like, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Like, you accept God and things change in your life. Who, who can share that good news if not us? If God's done something in our life and we're sitting here and we're living it up ourselves, but we're not sharing it, what are we doing? We're ignoring the brokenness and the hurting people around us. And that's not God's plan. It's not God's plan for them. It's not God's plan for us. He wants us to share that. Right? You guys with me? So, okay. So we get it. Holy crap. That's heavy. Thank you for beating us up. How do we do that? How do we do it? right? Okay, so God wants us to impact the world around us. God wants us to do this. How do we do it? First thing, remain in him. Check this out. I'm going to read through a bunch. All these scriptures come right right, right after another. It's in John chapter 15. Um, It's verse 5 through like verse 16 is what we're going to be reading, but I'm going to kind of go through it piece by piece. I'm going to just kind of bring you guys along with me, and then we're going to be done here. John 15, uh, I'm going to start verse 5 through 8. It says, I am the vine. This is Jesus talking. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they're burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Excuse me, I'm going to take a drink of water. My voice is like gone. You guys got me yelling too much up here. So so he's saying, so remain in him. He's saying, remain in me. Another another translation says, abide, live, like, like have your being, have your life connected to me. Because without me, you can do nothing. Separate from our relationship with God, we will not impact our families, our friends, our loved ones, the people that we have relationships with. We will not impact them the same way without God. Why? Because God is the one who created us. God knows what makes us uh, passionate. God knows uh, the skills, the talents, the abilities, the, the passions, the desires that are within us because he's the one who created them there. And separate from him, we'll never have the fulfillment that he meant for us to have. And separate from him, we can't, we can't show the people around us that kind of full life, right? Separate from him, we, it says, uh, um, what does it say? It's thrown aside like a branch and withers. Without him, we wither. Like if you guys have, have been following God for any length of time, you know that there are those seasons where um, you're just, you've let yourself just grow distant, grow stagnant, and you, you know what that feels like to wither, if you don't have a relationship with God, you probably knows what it feels like. You probably know what it feels like to wither because you might be there right now. You feel like there has got to be more. There's got to be more to my life right now. Like this is not it. Like I did not, I did not come here for this. There's got to be more than this. And God's saying like, yes, there is. And you find it when you're when you remain in me, when you abide in me, when you live life with me. So what does he say? So so how do you remain in Him? How do you how do you abide in Him? 
We're going to keep reading. It's keep his command. John 15, 9 and 10, it says, As the Father has loved me, I have also loved, in, loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So remaining in him has something to do with, with this keeping his command. Okay, fair enough. Well, what's his command? This is the next part. Love one another. John 15, 12. This is my command. Don't you love like when you like ask a question and then Jesus just answers it for you? Like sometimes we feel like, man, the scripture is so hard. Like, no, like if you just read it, it just spells it out for you. It's awesome. So God, what is the command? This is my command. Oh, okay. I just didn't read far enough yet. All right. Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. Well, how did Christ love us? Christ loved us self-sacrificially. Christ loved us in a way that wasn't convenient for him at the time. I don't know if there's ever a time when getting hung on a cross is convenient. God loved us in a way that gave him no personal space, no personal time, gave him no break. He was constantly moving, constantly working, constantly had people in front of him. He was constantly pouring out of himself, giving of his own resources, giving of his own energy. He was constantly giving of himself to help the people around him. So what does it look like to love others the way that Christ loved us? It means we might have to get our hands a little dirty. We might have to do something that's a little bit not convenient for us right now. Like think about a person in your life who just bugs the crap out of you just, God, you just hate it when you see them in the hallway, you know? Because you know they're going to come up and they're going to say something and it's, it's just going to be a terrible conversation. Well, like maybe that's the person that God wants to get something to and it's not convenient for anybody because they are legitimately just an annoying, terrible, leeching person. But God still loves them the same way that he loves you and he put his life and his word on the inside of you and you're the person that can give it to them. That is loving others like God loves us. And let's be honest, it's not always like that. Like, it's not always like that. Like, you don't have to have, be, like, just, like, self-debasing, like, I'm never going to have a good day my entire life. Because, like, like, no, God still had, like, Jesus still had a good time with his disciples. He still had feasts and parties. His first miracle member, wine, water into wine at a wedding party. Those parties lasted, like, a week long. They were having a good time. You know what I mean? I'm not saying Jesus was a drunk. Calm down, everybody. But... Like, he still had good times, but come on, he's on his way to one place to help heal this one person, and then somebody comes, and they like, kind of like grab on his cloak behind him, and then they get healed. Then he's got to stop and figure out, well, who the heck just got healed over here? So he can't even like take a couple steps down the road without somebody stopping him and needing something from him. That's not exactly convenient, is it? But he did it. Why? Because he knew that God had something for people that he was able to give. So what do we have we all have something different. We all have these, like, these, these little niches, right, that we fill. We have, we have our talents. We have our abilities. We have our passions, the things that we're into that nobody else is really into the same way that we are. Well, what's that mean? It means that we can touch all those people that those things touch. So what's our thing? Where can we touch people that maybe it's not always the most convenient for us? Maybe it's a little bit self-sacrificial, but God can use us in that place like he can use nobody else in that place because there's nobody else like us there. All right? So keep his command, love one another. And the last one is ask God. John 15, 16 says this, says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So we know we have people around us that are broken. We have people around us who need hope. We can help them by, by remaining in, in the Father, by, by uh, having this relationship with God ourselves, by keeping his commands, by loving them self-sacrificially. And, and, and he says, just ask for anything in my name and the Father will give it to you. Sometimes people take this verse and they take it out of context and they're like, well, shoot, I'm asking for a mansion. I'm asking for a Bugatti, you know, like whatever. Like, maybe that's not quite what God was talking about in context, you know? Yeah. Maybe he was talking about 
asking for, for him to move in the relationships of the people around you. Maybe he was talking about asking for somebody who is going through living hell right now to have a breakthrough in their life so that they know there's, there's hope on the other side and they don't have to end their, their life, right? Maybe, maybe it's not always like that crazy, but maybe it's talking about a friend who just doesn't know what the next move is. I don't know whether to go and move to this place for this school or this place for this school or to move this place for this job. Um, I don't know whether I need to pursue marriage with this person who I've had a great relationship with or I need to hold off just a little bit longer. You know, I, I, I know like it's sometimes I, I can be dramatic. I'm sorry. Um, sometimes it's just life decisions, life questions. What can I do? What can I do? Um, but God says, man, would you just ask me for direction? Would you just ask me for guidance? Would you just ask me for healing? Would you just ask me whatever it is that you need in your life, whatever it is that the people around you, whatever it is that they need in their life, would you just ask me in Jesus' name and I will give it to you. I'll give it to you. I think that we've been sent into wherever we are, whether it's school, whether it's, it's work, uh, whether it's being sent back to the family, like, I, like, like my family, the family that we came out of that we were like, God, I thought I was done with them. Nope, not done yet. Wherever it is, we've been sent there so that we could stand on their behalf in front of God and ask, God, would you move in their life? God, would you give them the life that you've given me? Would you give them the revelation that you've given me that I don't have to be ashamed of myself, I don't have to hate myself, I don't have to feel stuck in the rut that I've been stuck in, I don't have to do this because I know that you love me and you have a plan for me and you have a future for me, and God, would you show them that you have the same thing for them that you have for me? The reason a lot of us come to a place like this, come to church, come to hear from God, is because we are looking for God to say something like, I love you, I've got a plan for you, I've got a calling on your life, I've got a direction for you to head in, and we're looking, God, would you show that to me? God, would you show me the next place? And, and we're asking, God, give me, God, give me, God, give me. And he will. He will. He says he will. He promised that he will. But you guys, we have friends and family and loved ones who are in the same exact place in their life but they just don't know to ask God. We can show them. We can show them. Before we end, I, I do want to share, um, my goal, my goal, I feel like I've almost been like too negative. Like my goal hasn't been to guilt trip you guys into anything. It's just been to show you like, like man, we've got the God of the universe living inside of us. And, and he's given us life and he, and he has so much for us. And, and it's amazing, but if we just keep it to ourselves, then God, we're being so selfish. And, and there are people around us who just need to know that God is there for them because they feel just completely and utterly lost and abandoned. And so, so the goal isn't to, to guilt you into anything, but the goal is to say like, God, we've got the best news in the world, but what are we doing with it if we're not sharing it? Like, come on, like, if, I don't know, if, if you like went online today and Chipotle had this thing and they were like, we're giving away a million dollars worth of free burritos. Once the million dollars is gone, like it's gone. You'd be telling everybody, cause you're like a million dollars, we can get so many burritos. Guys, let's go to Chipotle right now and get so many burritos. I just ate Chipotle before this tonight and so I'm a little bit loving it right now. Well, come on, how much better news is this than like free Chipotle burritos? It's like, oh, hey, you don't have to live in condemnation for the rest of your life. You don't have to live in depression and anxiety and addiction for the rest of your life. You can have freedom. You can have new life. You can look at life with joy. You can wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm happy to be here. Instead of wake up and saying, God, I wish you would have took me last night. I have a friend who... Um, she just came to uh, the Hillsong concert a couple weeks ago, and um, I've known her for years. We, we've always talked, and she struggles with, like, depression. And, uh, and this, she texted me after the concert, and she was like, Chris, she was like, the, kind of a long story into it, but she was like, I was so nervous because there were some people there that she hadn't seen in a long time, and they, and they have, didn't have a great relationship the last time they talked, and they ended up sitting right like in front of her or behind her at the concert. So she was already like an anxious kind of person. She was, and so this just put her like over the edge. And I just told her, I was like, just ignore him. Like move to a different seat, ignore him. Like let God move in your life in this concert. So she texted me after she was like, she was like, after like the second song, I just closed my eyes and I just said, you know what? I'm going to forget about them. I'm just going to focus on God. And she was like, I cannot even describe to you how I feel right now. She was like, it's just different. It's just, it's just different. She didn't know how to describe it. It's just different. I just don't feel the same. I just feel different. I just feel peaceful. I just feel different. And she texts me almost every day. She texts me uh, the next day. She was like, I woke up happy. 
I woke up happy this morning. I woke, I woke up happy. Like, it was, a, it, was a, it was a life-changing thing for her to wake up happy. I wake up happy like every day. It was life-changing for her to wake up happy. She texted me like a week later. She was like, Chris, seven days, happy. Seven days, happy. She texted me like a week later. She's like, Chris, I'm still going. They think I'm super weird at work right now, but I'm still going. I'm like, come on, can we, can we get excited? There are people in life that are living broken lives that God wants to impact their lives so they wake up happy. So they wake up ready to live, ready to do something in their life. They don't feel like, I'm, I'm done with this. Like, she's told me before, I'm ready to check out. I don't see a point anymore. I don't see why. I don't see what the purpose is. And now she's like, I'm happy. It's two weeks, baby. I'm going. I'm happy. God is doing. Like, that is the power that God has. That is the power. That is the freedom that the gospel brings in people's lives. And we have that message to give. We have that God living on the inside of us. And if we're, sh- we're keeping that to ourselves, if we're not sharing that, what in God's name are we doing? So there's one last, one last thing, in, in, and i got to wrap up. Um, I went longer than I thought I was going to. Um, there's one last thing, though. That, that, like, that's the inspiration. That's the, come on, we got work to do. We, God wants to use us to do it, and that is amazing because I don't know about you guys, but I had a jacked up past, too. So the fact that God has me here right now, that's awesome, and I'm pumped about it. And, and it doesn't matter what your past looks like. God's got a plan for you, and he's got a place to use you, too, and that's amazing. But so, so here's the thing. Um, there's this story in Mark chapter 9 where this guy brings... This guy brings his son to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, my son, is, he, he's, been, uh, he's, 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 he's been, he's got this demon. It's thrown him into fires, and it's tried to drown him, and it's tried to kill him. And I took him to your disciples, and they tried to cast him out, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus gets, like, kind of ticked because he's Jesus, and he can do that. And he's like, you idiots, how long I got to do this for you? I got to show you. Bring me the boy. And so he, they bring him the boy, and he asks some questions, and he prays, and then the, the spirit leaves and the boy's healed. And so afterwards, the disciples are like, oh, hey, Jesus, like, we tried. We tried that. Why didn't that work? Like, why, why for you and not for us? And Jesus says, he says this. He says this kind of like weird thing. He says, he says this kind only comes out by prayer. In the Matthew version, he says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. And um, here's the thing. The moment that we accept Jesus, there's new life in us, and there's power in us that wasn't there before. And God, it doesn't take time for God to call us. We're already called by God. Like, it doesn't take time for us to be saved. Like, we are saved the moment we accept Jesus. We don't earn our way into heaven, you know. Um, it's not, you know, by prayer and fasting, uh, God is more pleased with you and, and God's happier with you and you've got a bigger, you know, chance to get it. It's nothing like that. But what he's saying is that there is something that happens where the more time you spend with God, the more God... Is, is evident in your life. The more time you spend with God, the more you're able, like, I, I like to, to think of it this way. Um, you can all think of somebody that you would not trust to, like, speak for you about something, right? Like, we might have friends that we would trust to, like, uh, to go somewhere to speak on our behalf. Like, even, like, this is a good example. Like, me being here right now, um, speaking for Josh while he's gone. Uh, there are some people Josh would probably not give a microphone to on the stage while he's gone, Right? Like, this is just an example. But you guys all know, you probably have a friend that you'd be like, no, I'm, you're not saying anything to anybody from me. No. Right? Well, why? Because that person hasn't spent enough time with you to know what you would say in a given situation, to know how you would react in a given situation, to be able to, to speak with the heart and the intent and the passion that you would speak in any given situation. We can't speak a voice that we haven't heard. We can't speak a voice that we are not familiar with. So the challenge is that if we take this seriously and we're going to impact people's lives for God and we're going to do something in people's lives for God, that means we're going to come up against some hairy situations. We're going to come up against some people who have real brokenness in their lives. And we want to be in a place where we can actually speak God and speak life into those situations. And just like the verse says, like, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and you can do nothing without me, Jesus says, this kind of only comes out by prayer and by fasting. He doesn't say, I'm only pleased with you, I've only accepted you, you only get to heaven by prayer and fasting. But what he says is, when you have intimacy with me, 
something more is going to be there. Like, if you want to come up against hard situations and your family and your friends and your own life and know, I'm going to get through this thing and I'm going to get through it with victory and I'm going to get through it the way that God intends me to get through it. What's that take? That takes some time away, you and God alone. Jesus modeled it. God, Jesus was always going away and spending time in the mountains by himself, spending time on the lake by himself, getting away from the disciples, getting away from the hustle and the bustle and spending time with God. Why? Because he knew if I'm going to do it, I got to spend time with God. If I'm going to change these people's lives, if I'm going to have anything to give, I've got to be filled up myself. So as we close out tonight, you guys are called. Everybody in this room, we all have our own sphere of influence. We all have our own friends, family, loved ones. We have our own jobs. We, we go to school. We, go, we do whatever we do. We have our own sphere of influence. God has called you to impact the people around you. So the question is, will you answer the call? And are you willing to grow in the relationship with God that it requires? We can't be Hakuna Matata. I can't be, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to do my parties. I'm going to hang with my friends. I'm going to do all the things that I like to do. And I'm going to go to church on the weekends or I'm going to go to church on Wednesdays. And that's fine. That's to get my God fix. Like if you want to impact people's lives around you, it's going to take more than a God fix. It's going to take a God life. It's going to take intimacy and closeness. It's going to take... God, I can hear you speaking. God, I want to be in your presence, and I want to speak your word to the people around me. So know this. If nobody's ever told you before, you are called. God has put a calling on your life to bring hope and to bring life into the world around you. So the question is, what do you do with it? And that's up to you guys.